Well, we're here with Ruben again at Vortex Optics, and we talked about binoculars earlier. So, um, and you mentioned rangefinding binoculars. So now let's talk about rangefinders. Yeah. So um, rangefinders are one of those products that you're not going to see such a vast assortment, such a huge, uh, you know, range from once to the, you know, from beginning to the highest, right? So there's a lot less options. So for a lot of people, that's going to be a lot less confusing when you're right. selecting the right rangefinder. Um, rangefinders, even more so than binoculars, we can actually be very objective when we're trying to decide which rangefinder we need. Um, what I mean by that is that when you're trying to look at which rangefinder to buy, um, look at what you need to range for. Um, if you're going to, uh, you know, do uh, a lot of archery hunting, and do you need the ability to range to four thousand yards uh, on an animal? It might be nice to know for making a stock if you need to determine how far you need to get to get up to a point where you're in range with that animal. But typically, what uh, a lot of um, a lot of archers are not going to need that long range, right? Uh, even with rifle hunting, you you technically don't need to range an animal at that distance because it's probably uh, outside of the range that most people are going to be able to ethically kill that animal. So. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of people that are competitive archers, there's a lot of people that are competitive shooters where it doesn't actually involve, uh, you know, harvesting an animal. So uh, we make a lot of different, uh, we, we offer a lot of different features in our binoculars for the different types of uh, shooting, hunting um, that people are going to be using them for. Um, there's a more defined price range too within binoc or within uh, range finders. So you're going to start out with our impact 850. Um, you're going to move up to a Ranger 1800, uh, you're going to have our uh, Razor 4000, and then go all the way up to range finding binoculars with the Fury 5000s. Um, the numbers with a, with a range finder are uh, they're, they're pretty simple, I would say. Uh, there's, they're open to a little bit of interpretation. If you were to say, look at the, um, let's just use a Razor 4000 for an example. Now that 4,000 is going to be the number at which uh, we would say our max reflective distance on uh, a fully reflective target or on a 100% reflective target. So what's a 100% reflective target? Mm -hmm. um, if we were to look at something like a stop sign or a road sign with a reflective film on it, that's going to be a, about a 100% reflective target. So take 100% of 4,000, we should be able to range something like a stop sign, something that has a very reflective surface at 4,000 yards. Now we would look at like a white-tailed deer as about a 40% reflective target. Um, those numbers are always going to change depending upon color, depending upon the, the time of day or ambient lighting, the, the sunlight direction, humidity actually plays a part in that. But if we were to say, let's look at um, We'll use a thousand yard range finder and if we had a 40 percent reflective target we could probably range that target at 400 yards um, so typically we don't like people to buy a, a 1000 yard range finder and expect to be able to range a deer at that distance because that target is not a 100 percent reflective target if you looked at like a steel target for shooting uh, a white painted steel target is about 80 percent reflective so you're not going to typically range uh, that target at 4,000 yards. You would do it at about 80% of that, that, right? So like a 3,200 yard on a Razor 4,000 if you're ranging steel. If we take that a step further, something that's very, uh, it absorbs a lot of that light that the IR laser is shooting out, uh, something like a black bear with a full coat, that's only about a 30% reflective target. And one of the reasons is because the color black absorbs light very effectively. That's why you wear a black shirt, you get really hot on a sunny day. Um, the other reason for that is that that, that um, surface that we're ranging has uh, a lot of texture to it. So all of that fur, that coat, is absorbing a lot of that laser too. So that's like the worst pos worst possible target we could we could range would be like a black bear with a very full, full coat. Um, it's always going to change again, too, based on the, the ambient light, the lighting conditions that you're in, the sun, um, the angle of the sun, and then things like humidity. Um, but nonetheless, if you were to 
say, I need to be able to range a deer at 2,000 yards, you'd probably want to go out and look at, you know, a 4,000 yard or more powerful range finder. Uh, if you were an archer and you said, I only care about ranging deer out to 100 yards, I mean, even the Impact 850 is going to be able to do that every time. So with uh, in regards to range finders, they start out at around $200 for Vortex, and they're going to go up through the $300 price point up to around $500 for the Razor 4000, and then the, Imp uh, the Fury HDs are going to be around $1,200. So if we were looking at that range, there's uh, it seems like there's a very low range to a very high range. Um, if we were to go up to that that Fury 5000 range finding binocular. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that you're also getting a binocular, a 10 by 42 power binocular with an HD lens element system. Uh, the lens, the optical system in, an, in a Fury is actually very similar to a Viper HD. So you're looking at our most powerful range finder with a 5,000 yard max reflective range and then also you're getting a pair of HD binos that are a six to seven hundred dollar value. So if you looked at that, it actually becomes a lot more attractive when you start piecing all the pieces of the puzzle together. And only one thing to carry, right? Yeah. Looking, you know, you're yep. you're looking at you know downrange with this, and then yep. you know and when you it starts to get closer, oh, put this down, grab something else. Yeah, absolutely. And when you if you were to look through uh, the Furies without the the display on inside. Um, they look just like a regular pair of binoculars. Uh, you only get that display when you power up the unit. One of the unique things I think uh, about Vortex rangefinders is that um, they're still covered no matter what under our warranty. Uh, the warranty uh, doesn't have like a three or a five year fine print under that, um, you know, because they do have an electronic component in them that may fail at some point in time, whether it be 10 or 20 years down the road, they could fail. So. Uh, one of the unique parts about that is that uh, every single rangefinder we make and every single product we make, even the ones with electronic components in them, still have the same unlimited, unconditional warranty. Now you said, you know, in the Fury, so it's, it's a 10 power binocular. And when we're looking at the Impact, the Ranger, um, the Razors, the magnification of that, is it all the same or does it vary? Um, the... Yeah, that's a good question. So the Fury being a 10 power, the, the Razor 4000 is actually um, a seven power optical system. Now think of uh, rangefinder is actually a monocular. They're not, uh, you don't have two barrels that you're looking through. Uh, if you go down into um, the Rangers, so the Razor would be a seven power, the Rangers would be like a six power optical system. Um, the, one of the other cool parts about the Razor 4000 is actually the optical system itself. It's uh, built on our HD lens elements that the, the Razor optical system, you know, in the binoculars and spotting scopes are very um, well known for. You're getting very good optical quality through the Razor rangefinder. Um, you know, and, and rangefinders have come a long ways in the last few years. Uh, it wasn't long ago that the Ranger 1800 was at a very similar price point to now what our Razor 4000 is. So it's a very effective monocular to when used without powering up the rangefinder. Now, um, what are some other features in the rangefinder that would um, be the difference between the Impact and the Razor? And um, what about, you know, high entry stand shots, maybe out west shots, uphill, downhill? Uh, one thing that we really hear from our customers that they really like uh, is actually the uh, belt clip on our Ranger and Razor series of rangefinders. Um, it's something unique to ours. I don't think you see that on a lot of different uh, rangefinders in the market. Uh, the belt clip is something that you can get, uh, put up on a, you know, a, a backpack strap. You can put it on an actual belt. Um, so one of the differences, the Impact does not have one. Uh, the Impact is uh, made of a very durable, very rugged material, but it's not rubber armored. Um, in terms of like where your hand goes, it's a textured finish. It's not um, an actual rubber armor. The Ranger uh, 1800s, um, in the past, we've had 1000s, 1300s, and 1500s. Currently, the Ranger 1800 is the model that we're making. Um, they actually have a full rubber armor around them. They have an aluminum uh, front and back uh, construction. And then uh, you can switch 
your um, belt clip from one side to the other if you need. Uh, internally, and then when you go to the Razor, that's actually a full magnesium chassis, so a lot more durable um, by weight. Uh, so the other thing internally, if we were to talk about differences, the impact uh, is going to be an LCD display, so a liquid crystal display. Uh, that is not illuminated, so it's a black display, much like a LCD watch face would be. Uh, so in low light, uh, people actually really like the Rangers and the Razor as well as the Furies because they do have that illuminated red display. In terms of the actual functionality of the range finding, the range finding component of these units, they're all very similar. Um, the HCD uh, is a mode that we have within the range finder. You have a, a, that actually stands for horizontal component distance. Uh, when you're shooting at angles, or when you're ranging at angles, either up or down angles, the uh, horizontal component of that range is lesser than it actually is if you stretch the tape measure from the target to where you are. Uh, and that's just due to the amount of time that gravity has uh, an effect on that projectile. So if you're ranging and you were shooting at an up angle or a down angle, we've all kind of heard like you're gonna hit high, correct? So if you were shooting at an extreme angle up or an extreme angle down, you're going to impact high. The reason for that is that gravity is only acting on that projectile, whether it be an arrow or a bullet, um, for the amount of time that that projectile is flying perpendicular to the force of gravity. So gravity being pulling straight down, projectile crossing that. Um, so what all that means is, is if you are shooting at a significant angle, that projectile is being acted upon by the forces of gravity uh, for less time than it would be if it was shot straight perpendicular to the force of gravity. That's why that impact is always high when you're up in a bow stand shooting down or even when you're down shooting up. Um, there is a little bit of uh, variance to that. Now, if you're shooting at an up angle, you're fighting gravity slightly more. Now, if you're shooting down, gravity is actually aiding you a little bit, but that's just a minuscule difference. Typically, you're always going to hit high if you're shooting up or down. What that circles back to is the HCD mode in this, which takes actually uh, a cosine of that degree uh, and your uh, it's able to give you the true uh, distance uh, that gravity is affecting that projectile for. So you have line of sight mode. Line of sight being, I like to explain it, take a tape measure from you to the target, and that's how far it is. And then you also have that HCD. Where that HCD mode plays in is when you have up or down angles. It's going to give you that horizontal component distance, uh, which is... Again, there's some marketing terms. A lot of different companies use a very similar type of technology. Um, we call it horizontal component distance. Uh, the, all the units that we make have that uh, functionality built into them. So typically, I would say if you were, uh, if you were actually hunting uh, and you know what most people would say is like very common distances that people may shoot an animal at, um, HCD is probably the mode you would use it in most of the time. Um, so with that being said, uh, they all have uh, adjustable brightness. They all have a scan mode where you can actually hold down on the range button. It'll continue to refresh uh, the range that it's giving. So if you were tracking something that was walking, maybe you had an animal walking at an angle towards you and you wanted to figure out how fast it was approaching, you can hold down on that and that scan mode will continually range the target over and over and over and it'll show you kind of the rate that it's walking towards you or away from you. Um, one other cool part about scan mode, if we get into like our Razor series, uh, is we have a first mode and a last mode. And the first mode, uh, if you can imagine, you have a, a target with a bunch of stuff in the background. And we've all had it before where we're ranging something and we can't hold it steady enough and we constantly get a yard that doesn't seem correct. First mode in the Razor series will actually take that image that, or that target that's closest to you and it'll give you the range of that target. 
so you don't have to worry about it arranging all the stuff in the background. It also has the last mode. So I like to explain last mode. Um, we have a really good video that explains it way better than I do. But last mode would be if you're arranging something behind a bunch of objects. And so let's say you're arranging through some trees or brush at a deer or a turkey, whatever you're arranging, the target, you'd hold on that scan mode uh, in last mode and it will only range the farthest thing that it ranges. So first mode and last mode are uh, something unique to a couple of different range finders. The entry level products don't have that, but um, some of the newer stuff that we're making definitely does. So those are some of the other features. You can change from yards to meters. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening with range finders here at Vortex. So we, we would invite you to stay tuned on that. So. Cool stuff. Very there. cool. So, so I think that pretty much wraps up. Unless you got any other questions on, you know, the the range finders and the different ones that are out there and different options that you have, and what you're looking for. So, um, I think next we're gonna uh, get into uh, some of the spotting scopes. All right, Ruben. Now let's talk about spotting scopes. All right, let's dig in. So, spotting scopes are uh, typically, you know, going to be uh, used with one eye looking through it at an image that or a target that's a long ways away. Now you also might be using them for something closer up but where you want to see a lot of detail. And one of the biggest uh, probably questions that we get at Vortex is which spotting scope should I select? And one of the unique things that we see a lot um, based on our customers kind of uh, habits with spotting scopes is that you might buy a rifle scope for every rifle you own, but you typically don't buy a spotting scope every time you buy a new gun, right? You, a spotting scope is something that you're going to, uh, we'll use the term, buy once, cry once, right? So they're typically gonna be more expensive than a pair of binoculars um, in regards to looking at like a, a razor versus razor binos, diamondback versus diamondback binos, so on and so forth. Uh, it's kind of a, one of those products that people save up for, uh, they, they take a lot of time deciding, and you want to buy the right one. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that gets people hung up, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, probably the number one thing people get hung, hung up on is eyepiece design. They want an angled eyepiece, or do I want a straight eyepiece? Um, now that depends on what you're using it for. The other thing that gets people hung up a lot is, do I buy, what magnification do I buy? Should I buy a 27 to 60? Should I buy a 15 to 45 or an 11 to 33? The way that I like to kind of tackle these questions is the same way I tackle everything else. What are you using it for? And uh, if we were looking at, you know, answering the question of uh, do I want to buy an angled eyepiece or a straight eyepiece? Well, there's, uh, there's a few things that you can take into consideration. Uh, with an angled eyepiece, I think that covers about 80% of people's needs. Uh, one of the only places that people typically don't like an angled eyepiece is if you were using it seated and you're looking at something like straight in front of you because you're going to have to have your head, your neck craned down the whole time you're looking through it rather than a straight eyepiece which you're going to be completely in line with what you're looking at. You're able to keep your head upright, your shoulders square, um, you're not going to be slouching right so one of the other things that we'll look at is are you going to be using it on a window mount if you're using it on a window mount a lot of times the straight eyepiece wins out i will point out that when you're using a, a window mount on any of the vortex spotting scopes you have this screw here on the side that you can actually pivot the entire body of the spotter so if we had a window mount i can always angle this spotting scope back to me being said it's typically still going to be more comfortable to use a straight eyepiece on a window mount. Those are a couple of things that I think probably uh, make people hang up more than they should. It's uh, you're going to just need to get out and try it. Go to a retailer, come to Vortex, go to a local Vortex dealer. Um, you know, find somebody you know that has a bunch of spotting scopes, whether it be Vortex or not, and try out angled and straight eyepieces. That's something that really you have to decide for yourself. Uh, the the other thing that we're talking about is the magnification. So do I buy, uh, if we were talking about razor spotting scopes, we start all the way down in the 
the micro razor, which is about the size of a 20 ounce bottle of Coke, uh, an 11 to 33 by 50, do I buy a 16 to 48 or do I buy a 27 to 60? I think the magnification is something that oftentimes gets overthought. I think what we want to look at is what physical size of the spotting scope can do you have room for? Uh, are we packing up the side of a mountain like we were talking about earlier where that little micro razor is uh, super handy? Uh, am I always going to be using it on the range and the furthest distance I'm ever going to have to carry it is from my truck to the stand where I'm shooting. Like those are things that you need to keep in mind. And that physical size is oftentimes more important than the actual magnification because what we're looking at uh, with any spotting scope is we usually don't see people running them at the max magnification. So they're typically going to be variable power, right? So if we looked at um, a 27 to 60, most of the time people aren't going to run it on 60 power. They run it on somewhere in between, somewhere from 27 to 40. Um, because as we increase that magnification number, when we're talking about exit pupil, the optic is going to get significantly less light coming through it. So when we go to a variable power optic, that exit pupil now changes as we change magnification. Same with rifle scopes. So uh, one of the final things to ask about buying a spotting scope, I think, is um, what do I want to spend? Uh, for us, we start with our Diamondback spotting scopes, uh, move up to our Viper HD, which is the first step into HD lens elements within spotters and then we go up to the razors. So if we're looking at um, binoculars, typically we would look at, you know, a Diamondback is a very high quantity. We sell a lot of those. And when we go into spotting scopes, we typically see customers selecting a more higher end price point uh, because you, you do see a significant difference in image quality. So it kind of flip flops. People will typically save up for a little bit longer and buy that kind of once in a lifetime or that kind of that uh, buy once, cry once, like we said before, optic. Okay. So, but in each one of our lines, we have, so in the diamond bag, the Viper, and the Razor. Now the Razor is the only one that's different. That has, because it's got the mini Razor, but the other ones have different options and different objective lens sizes, yep. correct? Yep. So the diamond bag is gonna be a 20 to 60 by 60 and a 2060 by 80. The biggest difference is the body size in the 60 millimeter Diamondback, significantly smaller than the 80 millimeter Diamondback. Um, the magnification is actually the same. Uh, they run the same eyepiece. Uh, but if we were looking at a Diamondback spotter, physical size, again, is going to be one of the things that is directly impacted by that objective lens diameter change. If we bump up to our Viper HD, we have a 15 to 45 by 65 and a 20 to 60 by 85. And the, again, one of the biggest differences there, other than the magnification, which is you know very obvious, is that physical size of the optic. So um, Diamondbacks will have this uh, knob style focus, whereas when we go into a Viper, you, you have that helical focus, it's a body focus. So what's nice about that helical focus is if you're changing diff distances, you know, going from something very close to something very far away, you can really crank on that knob and get it over real quick and change the focus fast. But having that large dial, you can actually fine tune the focus really well. If we move into the razors, um, that micro razor actually has uh, a knob style focus too. Uh, there's a fine and a coarse adjustment on that focus. Um, but moving into the 16 to 48 and the 27 to 60, in the Razer HDs, they also have this helical style focus or a body focus. Um, all of the spotters, the eyepieces can be taken off. Um, we do have some different eyepiece options for our Razer HD series. We have a wide, wide angle eyepiece and we also have um, eyepieces that have reticles inside of them. We can get into that a little bit more later, but um, yeah, so all of, the, all of the spotting scopes are very versatile. Um, but ultimately, before you, you know, get stuck with one, you need to decide which one you have that, that's going to fit your needs. Okay. And I see and that we have two of the lines are the HD glass again and then the Diamondback. So that would be real similar to the binocular line yep. where the Diamondback is 
real similar to our Diamondback um, binoculars and then and rifle scopes. Yeah, rifle scopes. Okay, and then into the Viper and the Razors. Yep, okay. absolutely. And again, uh, I would say this, and I would especially stress this. When we're talking about spotting scopes, we're not talking about you know a three to nine power magnification. We're talking about 20, 40, 50, 60 power. So that image is, uh, that glass is being put through a lot more. We're really trying to get as much horsepower out of it as we can. And that image, um, optical quality is really the biggest thing that we look at when we're talking about spotting scopes. I mean, it's already much bulkier than a pair of you know binoculars or a rifle scope. So one thing that has to be there is optical quality. And that's, you know, one of the biggest reasons we think that customers are, you know, typically going to buy a Viper or a Razor spotter as opposed to um, buying a more entry level price point spotter is because they're looking for that ultimate in resolution, the ability to resolve detail, um, performance in low light. Uh, when you're buying a spotter, you're it's not just like buying a pair of binoculars where you're hanging it on your neck and using it. You're pulling that thing out when you need it, right? And when you need it is when you need to see something a long ways away or seeing something up close, but at a very high level of detail, like a 22 caliber hole on a paper target, something like that.